numbers. Ooh. Oh, for how it goes? I just follow you. Nice. That's good. Come on down to that river Guarantees you'll never be the same There's a fountain flowing From the heart of the Savior Bring your sins and all your guilty sins Let that river of life wash it all away You know what I love? I love when we come in in the morning and we get ready to play music and everybody's standing up Gavin. and visiting. <laughs> just, it just is cool. That's awesome. That's exactly what you're supposed to be doing. W well, it's what you're supposed to yeah, do. You're supposed to be doing. Yeah.
To be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. that again softly. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a Sanctuary for you. Is that your heart's desire today? The Bible teaches us that we live in a different age this side of the cross. Most of us understand this. Years ago, they would... Uh, People who wanted to honor God, they would go to temples and they would offer sacrifices. And there was an entire, whole entire system involved in that. Kind of complicated, if, if you ask me. But we know that because of Christ's sacrifice, He was the once and for all sacrifice. And so, we understand that the Bible tells us that we, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's the sanctuary that we're singing about. And the good news is, God sees us as who we are. We just have to, have to simply come to Him in humility and repentance. It doesn't matter what's been the past. It means that we move forward trusting in His sacrifice. 
because he is our redeemer. He is our savior. And he gives us the opportunity to be that living sanctuary. Aren't you thankful? We, we don't have to go to an altar and offer a goat or a sheep. Jesus was the once and for all sacrifice. And that's why we're here to worship him today. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship. Near the close of the service, we'll be doing communion this morning. Uh, and much of this is about thinking about that and contemplating and uh, really thinking about preparation of our hearts and our attitudes in worship to Jesus. And I'm glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, I did want to mention a few, um, just a few brief things. Uh, as you come in, you'll see, again, we have a focus uh, much more on missions here in recent time. And uh, on the table there in front of the missions board, I want to invite you, if, if you would like to be part of what I'd call a missions uh, prayer support team, there are 15 different um, missionaries that we support and missionaries and missionary en endeavors. And so on that table, there are 15 different prayer cards, and it's just something you can take as a reminder. Take one of those and then be praying for those people consistently. Uh, missions is an important part of seeing the gospel touch people's lives all over the world, not just in the United States, but all over. And so you can feel free to take one of those. You can put it up on your fridge or put it in your Bible as a reminder. And every month we highlight one of those missions um, endeavors. And here in the month of January, we're highlighting Gideon's International. Gideon's is a well understood organization that's been around for quite some time where they really promote getting the Bible into people's hands. After all, that's what changes people's lives of the Bible is solid and powerful. And so uh, Leroy Freel will be here January 22nd, and that will be our quarterly uh, missions giving project. We've divided this up into quarters. Uh, we invite you to give to missions anytime you like, but once a quarter, we take a special offering for that missions project. And so uh, Leroy will be here on the 22nd, as he's, we've seen Leroy probably for the last, oh, dozen years maybe or more. Yep, and he's passionate about Gideon's International, and we're thankful to partner with them. And so this will be a way where we can join together with Gideon. So keep that in mind, and uh, do feel free to take one of those cards because every missionary that's supported out there, they appreciate when we pray for them. A lot of times people think it's all about supporting them financially. Most of the missionaries I talk to and the ones that we support, every one of them ask us to be praying for them too because they're going through different things worldwide. Uh, Becky, Jan's sister, has just took off, right? What I saw to Moldova this year. And so was SOAR International. So she'd appreciate you praying for that entire team. And so... Thank you for being a part of that, and I'm glad that you have joined us. Courtney and uh, Calliope will help with offering this morning, and then the kids can be dismissed. We'll pray over this offering, and we'll be diving into a brand new sermon series this morning. Some of the Bible studies are starting up again with the new year, so you'll see that on the announcements and starting even this week. And Lord, today we thank you that we can come and we can worship you. Lord, we thank you for all that you've given us. And Lord, we want to honor you. And we think of Gideon's International and the incredible team support that's involved in this. Lord, I pray that we'll get behind this as well so that your word can get into the hands of people, whether it's at a high school in America or in a motel or clear across the globe, Lord, we pray that um, your word will go forth, and we know that your word is powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And Lord, we thank you for your word, because it gives us truth. And Lord, we pray your blessing over this offering, and our time together, in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, I noticed something this morning as worship was beginning. I noticed that people were interacting and connecting and talking, and actually that's not a bad thing. You know, sometimes we can get a little stuffy in our church settings, right? And we can, uh, boy, you're right at the end already? Wow. I guess my sermon's done. That was the end of the PowerPoint. Stole the thunder there. Well, again, good morning. It sure seems like I haven't seen you guys for a whole year, you know? Yeah. Here we are in 2023, and, and uh, isn't God good? All the time. And His blessings are amazing, and He is faithful in every aspect of our life, and that's something that we can always hold on to. God is good when things are difficult. God is faithful. And I want to be an encourager you today. And as we start this new year, I want to kick off a new series with you. Um, and part of this is we're going to be looking specifically at the book of Hebrews. And you, you'll learn some background if you don't know some of that from Hebrews today. And uh, Somebody might ask, well, why would you do an exegetical study? For those that don't know what the word exegetical is, I'm not trying to be too brainiac here, but to explain it in some different avenues because it's really important. Um, being that the Bible is the single best way for us to hear God's voice, do you realize that? The Bible is our best avenue to hear from God. There's a lot of talk out there about hearing from God. Please remember, as a Bible-believing Christian, we want to always go back to His Word because it lasts through history. It has. Do you know there are people that tried to destroy the Bible many different times? I find it kind of interesting. It was in Germany or something like that in Europe where, where somebody, somebody throughout history, I don't know if it was through Adolf Hitler or others, but they were trying to destroy every scripture. They were burning them. Eventually, just a few years later, that place was, became a printing press for the Bible. <laughs> Pretty I ironic, isn't it? It's, yes, she did. So it's really important and vital as Christians, we take time to grasp what's in our Bibles, whether it's a, a scripture that you hold in your hands or even scripture that is on your smart device. It's all, you know, we're all looking at the same thing here. An exegetical study, it's the proper interpretation of the text or the process of discovering the original author's intention. It's where we look at historical context, um, literary context, where we discover what the purpose and the meaning from the original author is. And then we look at theological principles from that. And the most important thing is proper application. Because it's important that we apply God's Word truthfully and honestly. And Paul, he gave us really explicit instruction when it comes to studying and interpreting the Bible. He said this, and you're familiar maybe with this, was 2 Timothy chapter 2. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value, only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved as a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Speaking of the Bible, we want to correctly handle God's word. And it's important and explicit that we learn to do that as Christians. And so exegetical study is for every believer. Are you thankful that you can have God's word in your hand, folks? We can go, and that's something that Martin Luther was really passionate about. There was the church as a whole back in his day where they were getting wrapped up where only certain people had God's word and could only speak or read it. And Martin Luther said, that, that doesn't make sense. And he, he sees what Timothy or Paul was saying to Timothy here. We want to correctly handle his word. And as Christians, it's important that we stick to the solid interpretations and teachings of the Bible because Otherwise, false doctrine can arise, and we see false doctrine come out all kinds of different times throughout history. And what it does, it leads people away from the core truths of God's Word. And so, this is why exegetical study is important. I want to give you a little bit, since we're looking at 
the, the study on Hebrews, I want to give you a little background today. When we study Scripture, it's really important to understand different backgrounds. Hebrews is one of the few 27 New Testament writings with no clear author. Now, there's been debate for decades about who could be some of these possible uh, writers of Hebrews for, for centuries and centuries. And, and there are those out there that suggest that it's Paul because due to all of the Old Testament knowledge that's contained within Hebrews. If you read Hebrews, you see a lot about the law, all kinds of the customs. And Paul was well trained in that. And so he had extensive knowledge. There's others, though, that suggest it could have been Luke. Even Barnabas, Clement of Rome, who would be early in the church history. And there are even others that say it could even be Priscilla, who is mentioned in the Bible. And so uh, it's important to understand, we don't, the, the clear author isn't defined like other New Testament books. But that doesn't take away from the purpose, meaning, intent of the Scripture. Fundamentally, we understand that Hebrews, it's recognized by being inspired by God. Second Timothy speaks about that, which is actually the vital benchmark for canonization or understanding what God's Word is. I did want to point this out at the beginning so you can follow here. There are other religious texts. I just want to mention two of you. There are a variety of them out there, such as the Book of Mormon, which is interesting, only has one author who's had a supposed visit by an angel. That dovetails with another world religion, the Koran, with, which is Islam. It was written by one author who was supposedly visited by an angel. Do you understand? see that? It's kind of interesting. Does the Bible warn us about other visions and prophecies and to be aware of things that could be false? It does. Well, if you compare the Book of Mormon with the Koran, there is quite a stark difference. Some of you may know this. Some of this is new information. The Bible has 40 different authors that were written over the period of 1,500 years from three different continents and in three different languages. So when you compare, is there really any comparison, folks? There isn't. And it's important that we understand reliability. Are you going to take one person's word for something, or would you rather take a collection of a variety of people that are speaking about some of the same topics and information? I would trust the latter, right? So it's important to understand that. The Hebrews theme, there are two prominent themes woven throughout Hebrews, and I bet some of you can hit this right on the head, is the superiority of Jesus Christ and having perseverance in Christ. I actually think that that latter one is, is what most remember about Hebrews. You think of all the scriptures that talk about persevering in your faith, and Hebrews definitely contains that. Um, some date of the writing. We actually understand some of this this is historical. We're, we're not talking about a fiction book. The, the historical date is somewhere around 78, 79 A.D., and most scholars believe that's um, due to because in 70 A.D., what occurred? Somebody tell me. What happened in 70 A.D. was a big deal. Yeah, it's, it's there. You got it. Come on. What happened in 70 A.D.? Jerusalem, what about it? You're, you're getting close. You're getting warmer. What happened with Jerusalem? Yeah, not just the temple. The area was just decimated, destroyed. And so Hebrews actually doesn't bring that up. There's no mention of that. If this book was written after that date, we would probably see it mentioned because Hebrews actually deals with persecution of believers. And so that's why most say it had to happen right before that time period. And of course, the Hebrew audience, it was written mainly to the Jewish converts to Christianity. These were Jews who came to know of the truth of the gospel and that Jesus being the Savior, and they converted and decided to follow Christ like the disciples were going out and making disciples of everyone. Well, these Jewish Christians they began to feel a lot of pressure from Jewish counterparts, 
and they, uh, many of them were struggling in their faith. And that's the audience that this was written to. So, this morning in this first sermon, I've entitled this one, No Comparison. No Comparison. And I chose a, a different title for this series call, and I wanted to, you know, I thought of, uh, you look up Hebrews and perseverance is common, but I came up with the term grit. Grit. Grit is similar as perseverance, endurance, tenacity, resolve. If you have grit, generally you're someone who does what? You stick to it. Any of you here have grit about something in your life? I bet you do, right? You have determination. You persevere. And grit is important. And actually, if you think of it in the lives of these Jewish Christians, they had to have grit because, you know, they're unlike us. We're Christians in America where we haven't really dealt with persecution, folks. We have it, you know, like a cakewalk in many ways. And it doesn't take away from struggles, but when you have outer pressure to give up your faith or turn away from your faith, a person has to learn to develop grit. And this will be part of... Uh, in part, the entire study of Hebrews. And so we're going to look through chapter by chapter as we work through that. Now, as, it, as I mentioned again, most of us are aware of that central theme message of Hebrews about perseverance, and so it's really important that we think about it. This morning, you're going to notice something as we dive into chapter 1. Hebrews unashamedly speaks of Jesus. He is actually the culmination of all the Jewish law and customs. It's remarkable that all of these people that looked for the Messiah to come, the Jews understood this. And when Jesus shown up, they missed it. I mean, they had all these prophecies. They were directed to the Old Testament Scripture, and somehow they missed it. Well, that's the course of humanity. Sometimes we miss it. And this is really the culmination of Jesus. I want to point you to the text this morning, right in chapter 1. I'm just going to read verse 1 through 4, and then I'll highlight some of the other ones. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. Remember the setting that this belongs to, folks. We're talking about Hebrew Christians, Jewish Christians spoke through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things. And through Him also He made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much more superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. No comparison, folks. Think about that for a few moments with me. There is one comparison that is actually clear that we see in Hebrews. Jesus is the exact representation of God Himself, but in the flesh. Those religions out there that display or downplay, that downplay the superiority of Christ are missing the high mark that Hebrews establishes. And there are a lot of religions that will say a few things about Jesus, but they don't get it right according to Hebrews or other New Testament Scriptures. No other can be compared to Jesus. In fact, I I think we sing a lot of songs about Jesus. Maybe you're one that you talk about Jesus. Do you ever talk about Jesus in your life? Somebody might say, oh, they're a Jesus freak. You know, I'm not going to be unapologetic for talking about Jesus, even if I get kicked off the internet. No one compare to Jesus. No one. And I'm sorry, Jesus and Lucifer are not brothers like the LDS teaching holds. They're not brothers. There's no comparison. Jesus is much more than just a good prophet or a good teacher. 
Do you realize that? He is much more according to Scripture. Here's something interesting as well. Islam teaches that Jesus wasn't even the Son of God. What's their viewpoint? Well, they're kind of kicking Jesus to the side. He was actually less of a prophet than Muhammad. He's the one guy that got the vision from an angel and started this entire world religion. And he takes Jesus and steps him down. Pretty important. Hebrews chapter 1, it really gives us some important distinctions about Jesus. I want to point you to those this morning. There's four there at least. Number one is Jesus is the heir. Heir. That's, that title is highly significant. And in this culture, I know in our culture today, we don't use heir too much, do we? Not really. Not really. Maybe when it comes to an estate, there's a little involvement in it. But in this culture, when somebody was given this title of an heir, it means something powerful, important. It, we understand that Jesus was preeminent, meaning that Jesus was first. He was first. Through Jesus, the universe was created. When I did some study in this, this area of Scripture, in the Greek language, the word for universe is aeon. Well, in the English, we use eons, right? That's significant. Jesus is the heir. David Guzik, he's a writer. He's somebody I look to if you like to look at online Bible studies by uh, blueletterbible.com. David Guzik writes a lot there. And this is what he says. It means that Jesus made more than the material world. He also made the very ages. History itself is the creation of the Son of God. You see how significant Jesus is and far more superior? He's the heir. Is there anyone else who can compare to Jesus? None. None. Number two, another distinction. Jesus is the revealer. We notice in the text here this morning, uh, uh, verse 3 in chapter 1, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Obviously, if Jesus sustained all things by the powerful, uh, power of his word, he was pretty incredible and is pretty incredible. In other words, Jesus exact, exactly represents God to us. You can look that up in Colossians 1.15 where it speaks of this. While present here on earth, Jesus was fully God and he was fully man. And this sets him apart from any other being. Any, even an angel. In fact, if you recall, I mentioned this a lot of different times, but it's important to note. When Jesus referred to himself as the I Am, why was that so significant in that culture? Why was it when he'd say, I am the good shepherd, I am the bread of life? What was Jesus doing? He was saying he was God. And that got the religious Jewish people ticked off. That's exactly why he was thrown on the cross, why he was persecuted. He is. And so we understand from, Rev, uh, from Hebrews and other scriptures, Jesus is the revealer. He is God himself in the flesh. Number three, Jesus is the redeemer. The entire Old Testament sacrificial system, I, I mentioned that a little bit earlier today. It served its purpose for its time. I'm glad that we don't live in that era. Whereas Christ's atonement was for all sin. Every sin, every past sin, every present sin, every future sin. That's how significant the cross of Jesus is. And it marks the a pinnacle of God's great plan to do what? To redeem us. As a Christian, why do we hold dear to what Christ did on the cross? It's our salvation. He redeemed us. 
We see so much that the Hebrew writer here attributed a very special designation to Jesus in the scriptures there as we looked at in chapter 1. It says that he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Now in cultures that are much different than ours that were uh, ruled by emperors, I mean we see little ideas of this even in our culture, but when someone sat down at the right hand of some throne, their right hand, they, there was much respect given to them. I think in even American democracy, culture, republic, there's even some of that. When somebody is next to our president, there is some honor given to them in some ways, right? But in this culture, it was far more significant. And the Bible tells us that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And this spectacular imagery speaks that the majesty in heaven with Jesus sitting next to him means that there's no comparison. No other comparison to Jesus, past, present, future. It also shows us something else. When it says he sat down, Jesus finished his work. He sat down. After a long day when you sit down, you're usually doing what? Relaxing, you're finishing your work. Well, think of that culturally in respect to Jesus. When he sat down at the right hand of the majesty, he finished his work. He conquered sin and death. And then number four, Jesus is the superior. You see four different things here. Heir, revealer, redeemer, now superior. Now, I don't understand this fascination that's out there. There are some people that are so fascinated by angels, right? There, how many times have you heard of some news story of an angel sighting? And then people are flocking to it. And they're bowing down and they're worshiping. I'm not fascinated really by angels, folks. <laughs> I'm fascinated by Jesus. Why? Because He's superior, according to Hebrews. We have to understand that angels are just simple messengers from God, while Jesus is given such a great and higher honor. See, Jesus wasn't just a good teacher. He was far superior. Let me point you to a couple of these things in, in chapter 1. Some of the Scripture goes on in verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father? No one, no comparison. Is there anywhere in Scripture where we read that God said to Lucifer, You're my son, and I've become your father? No, there's nothing there in Scripture. Also says in verse 6, and again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Hmm, I thought we're only supposed to worship God. Well, Jesus is in fact the very exact representation of God, worthy of worship. Verse down in verse 8, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hatred, wi hatred and wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Jesus is giving, been given such a higher honor and superiority. Down in verse 14, wrapping up that chapter, the writer says here, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? See the distinction here? Angels, don't get wrapped up in angelology, folks. Don't. We look to Jesus because He is the author and perfecter of our faith. There's no comparison to Jesus. And no one should cheapen the superiority of Jesus. No one. And when religious teachings out there and other books apart from Scripture say they are the full account or this, those are cheap gimmicks, folks. 
We can't cheapen who Christ is. And the distinctions given in Hebrews and other New Testament scriptures, they're fundamental to our beliefs. They're fundamental to biblical Christianity. And it points us all in the direction that this is about Jesus. So what is it that we learn in the opening verses of Hebrews? I want to suggest or submit to you today, there is substantive evidence of Christ's superiority over all creation. Every bit of it. And that is significant. Let me point you to a few. Isaiah. Isaiah is someone who the Jews were looking to because he was a prophet, right? Just like chapter 1 starts, in times past, God spoke through various prophets. Isaiah was one of them, and he foreshadowed Jesus. He said this, Isaiah 46, 5, With whom will you compare me or count me as equal? To whom will you liken me that we can be compared? He was, Isaiah was speaking of God. Well, Jesus is given this comparison. Who could be equal to Jesus? No other creation. Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been, give, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and every authority. That puts him God. He's equal to God. All the fullness of the deity lives. Another one, Matthew 28, 8 and 9. This is after Jesus, after the, the resurrection or during that time. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, collapsed at his feet, and what did they do? worshiped him well we're only to worship the one true god well jesus was right there in the flesh and they fell at his feet and worshiped him let me point you to another one john 20 verses 26 through 28 a week later his disciples were in the house again and thomas was with them through the doors Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Notice Thomas' response. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Did they recognize who Jesus was? Thomas had a little doubt, didn't he? That can be encouraging to us, folks. If you've ever wrestled with doubt, you know what? We're in good company. Thomas did. And Thomas recognized who he was, and he said, You're my Lord and my God. Who can be compared to Jesus? No one but God. God in the flesh. And this is what separates Christianity from all world religions. Who Jesus is. Who He was, who He is. I came across a, a great quote this week, and it's from Anonymous. Maybe you've heard of Him. There's a lot of them out there. Jesus is the only God who has a date in history. Let that sink in. Jesus is the only God who has a date in history. We can't compare Jesus to anybody else. I don't care what Muhammad the prophet said he had an angel came and visit him, or Joseph Smith said he had an angel come and visit him. Those are all hoaxes, folks. We understand from the Bible that Jesus is far superior and there is no other comparison. I'm going to ask the worship team who's left here this morning. <laughs> I'm going to ask the worship team to come, and we're going to close in communion. Why do we celebrate communion? Because of what Jesus has done for us. Not any angel, not any other person. 
We celebrate in communion because Jesus is our Savior. Who can forgive us of our sins? Jesus. You know, there was a time when, when Jesus talked about forgiving people of their sins, and it upset the Jewish people around. Ooh, boy. Why? Because they understood only God can forgive sins. So, you'll see more and more as we work through Hebrews, speaks of how superior Jesus is. I want to encourage you today, don't be afraid, never apologize for talking and worshiping Jesus, folks. He's everything to us as believers. Everything. And we trust in Him. This is a communion song, Remember Me. Speaking about Jesus. And we're going to sing through this and Chuck and I will pass out communion. And we just want to invite you, if, if you're a believer in Christ, if you ask Christ to forgive you of your sins, if you're desiring to follow Him, you can trust in Him today, folks. He forgives us as far as our sins are from the east to the west, which is a lot, which is incredible. There's no comparison to Jesus, is there? Let's go ahead and sing. In the night you were betrayed
What a great reminder to us today out of Hebrews, isn't it? That there is no other comparison to that of Jesus. I kind of like to sum it up in, I don't mean this to be sacrilegious or anything. God saw fit to just come and do business. When mankind forgot him, when mankind turned back on him, what did God do? He came in love to fix the issue. You know, God is still working on me every day. How about you? Is anybody here perfect? You know, the good news is you don't have to be perfect. I mean, it's impossible. Only one was perfect. Jesus. And that's why he stood in for us. And as we take this communion today, it's a simple reminder this isn't the blood or body of Jesus. I mean, we don't pray over it and make it magical. No, it's, it's just meant to be a reminder of what Christ has done. And I hope this morning that you can be encouraged in understanding more and more about who Jesus is. Let's pray. Lord, today we come recognizing that you're the heir of all things. You're the creator of everything. Lord, you are far superior than any angel. You're definitely far superior than Lucifer. Lord, and we worship you. We worship you and we give you praise because you are our redeemer. And Lord, Lord, like Thomas, we can actually say, you are my Lord and my God. Lord, today we come in awe and respect of you. And we thank you for your sacrifice and that you give us eternal life. Lord, I pray that we'll learn more of you each and every day and we'll look to your word so that we can understand what you desire for our lives. And Lord, in agreement today, we all understand there's no comparison to you and we give you praise and glory lord thank you for sitting at the right hand of the majesty in heaven lord we thank you today and we remember you we pray this in your mighty name amen feel free to take of your bread and your cup As we close today from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, it says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. I pray today that you will be encouraged and hang on to Jesus and persevere in Jesus every day of your life. God bless you. Thank you for coming today. Amen.